This is Call the Psychiatrist, the show where psychiatrists answer your questions. I'm Dr. David Hanley. And I'm Dr. Abby Snavely. On today's episode, we'll be reviewing the New York Times bestseller, Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. Say you like me, you better count the ways. I wondered if you had any comments, corrections, reflections on episode two. Yeah, um, you may recall that I talked about my hesitancy using Vicks VapoRub when I had a small child. So just to confirm my, uh, my suspicions, I did a quick literature search and I found a lot of case reports of toddlers going to the hospital with seizure <laughs> after a camphor ingestion. So I just wanted you to know that there was some basis for my, for my fear. I thought it was a Curious George storyline, so I'm glad to know it's also a real thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> no, it's a real thing. Okay, good. Apparently, kids love to eat the stuff, and it causes them to seize. So, I, I think I was in the clear. But I, uh, you mentioned my max neurosis, so I thought I should revisit that. Well, I'm proud of you. Way to way to confirm both the theory and the max neurosis. <laughs> um, I take it you no no feedback from you. It was it was fine just the way it is, right? It was brilliant, not fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so <laughs> thank for you this- for laughing. <laughs> and and editing. I just, right. you know, I'm just manifesting that out in the universe. So we'll find <laughs> out if it comes true. We'll find out. Yeah. Um all right, well, I don't have a recorded question to play for this episode, but we did get several questions and I think I could summarize them all as what did you think of this book or um is this what schizophrenia is really like? And uh, Abby, you mentioned one recently, uh someone asked you did all these people really have schizophrenia. So I, I thought rather than just pulling out one, uh, it really came down to, uh, we should probably just review this book. Um, so just as a reminder, Absolutely. yeah, this is Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. So um, Abby, do you mind giving us just a, a quick summary of the book for any listeners that haven't read it? Absolutely. This is a story, a true story. The book is a work of narrative nonfiction about an American family with 12 children. The kids were all born between the mid-40s and the mid-60s. And eventually, six of the 12 children were diagnosed with schizophrenia. The book follows the story of this family, um, their hopes for living the American dream, their expectations for achievement uh, within the family. And then as the story goes on, it is not just a story about this family and their plight, um, but the story of the scientific community's attempts to understand both diagnosis and treatment of schizophrenia. The, the setup of the book is to end in the scientific triumph um, that we have a greater understanding of schizophrenia by the end of it, and I think is, is the author's hope, including, I think, some idea that this family's massive amount of misery and suffering was worth something. So I want to give a spoiler alert, just a blanket spoiler alert, that we're going to possibly be discussing any part of this book. And so if you haven't read it, potentially anything we say is a spoiler. So we won't give that warning anymore after this one. I also wanted to give a bit of a content warning. There are a lot of traumatic events experienced by this family, including sexual abuse, suicide, murder. And so that's just a heads up if these are topics that you'd be better off not hearing today. So in terms of when this book was published, the Oprah Book Club selected it as you know, one of Oprah's favorites on April 7th, 2020. It then debuts on the New York Times bestseller list at number one later in April. And it ended up on Barack Obama's year-end reading list. So this was a very popular book. Um, the only reason I read it was actually at your recommendation, Abby. Um, you said you liked it. Mm -hmm. You thought it was thought-provoking. And I definitely felt provoked, but maybe just irritated. Well, I want to start by kind of with a question of why is this book so popular? Um, so I've treated lots mm -hmm. of people with schizophrenia, and I've always taken away from that that on a societal level, these people are some of the most uncared for and unloved people out there. I think at best, mm -hmm. the world finds them to be an inconvenience and to be ignored. And so I'm actually curious why people have embraced this book so much. I mean, do you think that people really want to know more about schizophrenia? Or is this just a more typical voyeurism? 
Um, and I understand that people love to read about, uh, you know, a person's trauma and is this just more of the mm-hmm. same, but it has this twist of a rarely discussed illness. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I've been very surprised, I guess, at the reception of the book. Well, you already mentioned the Oprah and Obama-ness of it all, right? And, uh, you know, arguably Oprah is probably one of the most powerful people in the world to get someone to read a book, I guess, or a gazillion people to read a book. Uh, I suppose we could talk about why would Oprah choose it? Again, I think it is a very dramatic story with a lot of really moving, evocative scenes of of violence and dysfunction and disruption. I think it is a pretty compelling story of, you know, this family trying to, like I said, live the American dream and what happens to their hopes and dreams. Um, do you think that people just, I mean, you just established Oprah and, and her power. I mean, do you think uh-huh. critics don't want to go against that? It, again, it debuted as a bestseller. And so are critics less likely to criticize yeah. something that is so popular? I also wonder, are critics just worried that their criticism will be viewed um, as uh, being unsupportive of, you know, mental health treatment or, you know, some some criticism of mental illness? Or as generally? you said, very very marginalized people. I do think that in our society, mostly for the better, you know, disenfranchised, disadvantaged, oppressed people are getting more attention, um, or at least the systems of oppression. I still agree with you that mental illness and severe, persistent, chronic mental illness is some of the worst. And yeah, it might be hard to get people to care about, you know, well, it's, we know it's hard to get people to care about homeless people on the street talking to themselves that have poor hygiene. Um, so maybe there is some sort of cultural moment of that, of these kind of oppressed people. But I also think it's a real – they make it into a real novelty story. This isn't necessarily about one person's plight with psychosis. This is about a family, and I know we'll talk about that, and specifically – you know, a mother, a mother of this giant family that is an oddity. There, I, I'm sure there is voyeurism, but I don't know. I don't know if you have a better theory than that. No, I mean, I, there are definitely interesting parts. I mean, I, I don't want to get, you know, don't get me wrong on that. But I, mm-hmm. I guess I'm surprised that people weren't just a little bored. I mean, once you get past the first third to half of the book, it, it really slows down quite a bit. I, I think as a medical mystery, which that was the, the Oprah blurb as a medical mystery, it's really anticlimactic. I mean, the author keeps trying to raise the stakes, you know, discussing these detailed genetic studies. Mm -hmm. And there's this constant Mm -hmm. tension that a hero is about to emerge. And then he finally says, well, science isn't about breakthroughs. It's about incremental change, which, which is a (laughs) hundred percent true. I mean, he, he just, he's building and building the stakes. It's long, it's mm-hmm. tedious, and then nothing really happens. Well, I will tell you that at least one of my friends said that her take-home point was that psychiatrists really know very little, and she was kind of shocked to know how little we knew what we were doing. So maybe hilariously, this this uh, lack of of knowledge or understanding of schizophrenia was generalized to all of the mental health field. Though I don't, you're right, I don't think that's what the author was going for at all. Um, I know my mother only made it about a third of the way through the book, and she's a voracious reader. She said her life's too short to read something so boring. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I was concerned about people that would drop off after the first third because they have Mm -hmm. such a, uh, we'll we'll get into this more in detail, but about their view Mm -hmm. then of what the illness looks like. And I thought maybe some of my boredom, it could be, is because you know, I'm familiar with the research. Um, I mean, there's there's very specific things that you and I were obviously lectured on. You know, we were in that department. And so we heard lots about sensory gating and nicotinic receptors and things. But I still thought that the general public could be so enamored by that. I don't know. I Again, it was just, it's just a surprise to me because it wasn't compelling. Well, so, okay. So you're talking about the boredom piece. And then as foreshadowed, there's the irritation piece. And I definitely see why the general public would not be as irritated as you 
or I am, or a, a reader who spent years and years studying this stuff. Because there's, I mean, for this, this you know, award-winning author, um, investigative journalist, or whatever he is, there's a lot of factual min- misinformation, psychiatric information, medical information. Not a lot of rigor was applied, which I think you know, is maybe, I don't know if you would say that's the headline or the theme of the irritation. Um, But again, when I thought I was just reading it for fun to talk to my friends who aren't you about it, I kind of let that go and just decided to pay attention to the story and not the science. Well, my, my irritation with the factual inaccuracies was only because it compounded um, this vigilance I had about this narrator, this omniscient narrator who is withholding things and it's unclear where the source material comes. And then I start hitting little bumps in the road about maybe some factual misrepresentations. And so then I start questioning mm-hmm. everything. Um, so I think that's what made me. Fair. Yeah. I think that's, that's where my irritation was. Not, not that there were errors. It's that there were errors in a structure that was not satisfying to me, but I, I want to get back to, again, for me as a medical mystery, I thought it failed. Mm-hmm. And I think there's mm-hmm. this other intention of the book. What I took away from it is that it's supposed to be this story of redemption. There's a thread, and, and you mentioned this, I think, in the intro, that mm-hmm. there was suffering that the family endured and that there's going to be a tangible payoff, that there's going to be a scientific discovery mm-hmm. that leads to a better treatment or a cure essentially mm-hmm. that others can benefit from their suffering. And that's almost stated, um, mm-hmm. stated very mm-hmm. explicitly by one of the kids. But he doesn't deliver that story. And so we get this bromide that things will probably get better in the future. And I, I don't know. I, I, I just I, He was trying to manufacture something that never actually came to pass. And so I don't know. I just think it failed on, on two big ideas. I think it is worth mentioning as well to piggyback on what you said, that I think the primary source material for at least the narrative of the family were the two youngest children who were the daughters. Yes. And I think that as much as, you know, we we can hold the author responsible, which we should, but I think at least in the telling, it was pretty clear that that, that, that idea that the family's suffering had been worthwhile that at least one of the daughters wanted her own suffering to have been worthwhile, right? That that her own tragic story would benefit other people. And and her brothers, some of whom had abused her, you know, that that that, that also maybe let them off the hook or I don't know, some some sort of absolution or redemption. Agreed, agreed. I don't think it pays off, but I also it's you're right. Kolker presents himself as this like omniscient narrator. I, I guess he doesn't present himself, but he writes it that way. But I'm not sure that it's not really primarily at least like the narrative aim or ambition of the daughter or daughters to paint their family in this way. Well, I, I agree that I, the story in my mind is really about these two women and, and maybe really specifically one woman, but, but I think, I think both of the daughters are in on this decision-making that they're trying to make mm-hmm. a sense of their childhood trauma. And that is a perfectly fine yeah. book to write. And I think it gets, mm-hmm. it gets only engaged in the last half after we go through the big splashy stuff, like the big events that are going to yeah. pull people in to get your mom to read the first third because of all the, uh, the insanity going on in the house. And I just think it mm-hmm. would have been fine to start with these women or just to stay with them because he does introduce the, the idea kind of in the, like an intro or prologue or something. Sure. Um, and then we would know where the source information is coming from. And we could understand that a lot of these opinions about the family are filtered through their own memories. And I just right. think it would have been way more authentic which are inherently biased, right? I mean, there's just no way around that. And that's fine. Yeah, the inconsistencies then are like, right, memory is inconsistent. Like, memory is fallible. And and that's okay because this is a, a retelling. But instead, we start out again with... Well, and memory's changeable. Right. Yeah. And how many times have they told this story to get here? Yeah. And, you know, and he cites all the other interviews he had. 
and that's fine. It's just, mm. I would have liked to have known how the perception of the family was shaped or by whom it was shaped. Was it a child who's remembering 40 years ago? Was it a contemporary 40 years later? I, I don't know. I think that would have actually made it more compelling and less, uh-huh. I don't know, less artificial. I, I want to, okay. but I do want to point out that like, so halfway through, we suddenly change gears dramatically. We finally engage with these these two daughters. You know, we go through, this one daughter has 25 years of therapy. He's now interviewing her therapist. The other daughter has submitted her journal mm-hmm. entries. We even, there's like several pages about a dream that she's <laughs> had. The core of the story is their grief and their reconciliation. So I don't know, just make them the narrators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no argument. All right, well, let's... Let's talk about the way schizophrenia was portrayed in the story. I think if this is somebody's first introduction to schizophrenia, then the author has done a huge disservice for this illness. You know, I went into the book assuming, like the book jacket says, that six of these kids have schizophrenia. And then for the first half of the book, he gives no credible account of the symptoms or behaviors, you know, to make me conclude that they Mm -hmm. have schizophrenia. So I was, I was Right. Pretty put off by that. What I did get was a lot of sociopathic behavior. I mean, we've got cruelty to animals, fire starting, child mm-hmm. sexual and physical abuse, spousal abuse, mm-hmm. alcohol addiction, drug abuse, premeditated murder, attempted murder. I mean, this is a terrible depiction of the illness, especially, you know, like your if somebody like your mom, like they don't even they don't even get to any descriptions of the psychosis. And I'm not saying that people with psychosis can't also have sociopathic behavior or harm people or engage in criminal activity. But, you know, people with schizophrenia are more likely to be the victims of violence, not the perpetrators. And I, I don't think a general reader would would ever come away with that idea. Oh, absolutely not. And I I mean, even in my sort of, oh, this is a this is a juicy novel kind of delusion I had when I was first reading it. It felt more like he was focusing on this external behavior this violent behavior, which I've, as you were saying, is, you know, not just inaccurate, but probably damaging and stigmatizing towards people with this diagnosis. Um, but also no description of the the inner life of these people. The actual experiences of the mentally ill people in the family are not really represented throughout or any accounts of what it might be like to, I don't know, have hallucinations or delusions or a thought disorder. Yeah, I'm, I will say in the second half of the book, when the author presumably got to interview two of the surviving brothers, um, you know, he, he writes pages and pages of an interview, which at least shows, you know, somebody with severe thought disorder. Uh, the medical records, he has more complete medical records, you know, because we're getting into more contemporary times, mm-hmm. last few decades. And so, you know, he, he writes from the medical records where, um, you know, Peter is, um, he attacks a staff person and breaks their ribs and he's profane and he's difficult mm-hmm. to control. It, I mean, mm-hmm. it gives you at least a flavor maybe for the difficulty in caring for but them. But is that psychotic? Well, he, he does do a lot of descriptions around the delusions that he's having at the same time. But you're right. I mean, that's a, it's a good question yes, because okay. he does. I mean, that particular brother, too, had a lot of. But even there, right? Like that just in that description, there's not enough to know. Yeah. And I mean, I was trying to give some credit that at least you get a sense of psychotic thinking and delusions. Sure. What I still, though, would criticize is that he doesn't give us much room to empathize with them. By that time in the story, the only empathy we can have is that the mother is grieving, you know, the, the, these children mm-hmm. that were so affected. But even then, it's short-lived because we're so focused on how the unaffected siblings are so resentful towards these brothers. Um, he, he makes a little bit of an exception for Joe, who was the, that's the seventh child. Um, and I think it's because Joe has some insight into the fact that he's ill and so he he knows he's hallucinating, mm-hmm. and I think that gives us a sense of his suffering, and so we can be more empathic for him. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, yeah, he he's focused more on the behaviors that drives everybody a little crazy. Well, th- yeah, that bother everyone else, which I think is also maybe a yeah. bit how the world treats treats these people. But if this is supposed to be an insight into 
this family's experience, I think, you know, I think psychosis is really scary and terrifying for a lot of people, right? Not just, not just the people around them. You know, for me, one of the biggest omissions was the fact that he didn't really give much time to the idea of drug-induced psychosis. You know, that's not Mm -hmm. uncommon. And he gives evidence that almost every kid uh, was using some type of drugs, hallucinogens, some were using stimulants. He mentions um, amphetamines and cocaine more specifically. And, you know, even the mm-hmm. the, the kids who grow up and, and clearly have a chronic psychotic illness, you know, I think had that been mm-hmm. in the early part of the story, we could have better understood even some of the symptom development, how they would get so ill and right. then seemingly resolve completely. And there would be this time period of what appears to be normal functioning. About halfway, he lets the mom wonder aloud, you know, what impact the drugs may have had. But I mean, it's just a very brief mention. And I, I don't know, I thought that was a real miss because right. it's laced throughout, um, again, both through the affected siblings and the unaffected, but shadowed over. And it just makes me question more. Yeah. It, but including very early in childhood, right? Where, you know, one of the girls is smoking a joint at the age of five, but I think at times it's like you said, if if you're not paying close attention, it may seem like the schizophrenia came first. Right? Well, you know, part of me thought, you know, maybe he's not wanting to talk about it because he doesn't want to complicate the picture that so that no one would come away thinking drugs cause schizophrenia. Then why did he focus on so much violence? Well, and, and why he had no problem saying schizophrenia causes violence. Yeah, and also he wanted to really focus on uh, the environmental pressure, how the environment may. Again, there's pre, there's um, there's that diathesis perhaps towards the illness, and then what trauma he, he focused so much on mm-hmm. the trauma that may have uh, revealed their psychosis, but didn't even take up the mm-hmm. the easier explanation. I mean, if you're going down that path of theory, he didn't take up the easier explanation. Well, maybe the drugs uncovered, or maybe <laughs> as we know, chronic use of hallucinogens often result in people having chronic psychosis. And we think that might be Indeed. separate from schizophrenia, but, you know, who knows? At least the trajectory looks different. Right. And the other thing that I was disappointed about, and very pertinent to this family, um, was the fact that schizophrenia in this country, starting in the 1940s, was way overdiagnosed. I mean, more than more oh, than yeah. any similar country or, you know, countries in Western Europe. He, he comes close to the idea when he talks about Michael, this is the fifth brother, you know, he does a lot of acid. Mm-hmm. He's the one that ends up in the hippie commune. And he later will say, oh, mm-hmm. oh, that one was misdiagnosed, right? Because of, maybe right. because of the drugs and maybe because of the counterculture. I mean, he does have that criticism of psychiatry, which is mm-hmm. completely fair. But then sure. in that brother, he does it, but he doesn't then extend it to some of these others, you know, to, to investigate as, well, maybe there's some blind spots over here that would be worth looking at. Right. I mean, back then housewives who were annoying to their husbands could be diagnosed with schizophrenia. There was a whole phenomenon as outlined in this book, the protest psychosis where, you know, black men that were being part of the civil rights movement were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, And in both of those cases, often as an excuse to either medicate or, you know, in incarcerate slash institutionalize these people that were being bothersome to society without very, you know, strict diagnostic criteria. So I guess I would have been open to the idea of saying this brother was diagnosed with schizophrenia at this time in this year based on the understanding then, but that, you know, talking about the evolution of the diagnostic criteria that hopefully has gotten more precise and tighter where a lot of the people back back in the 40s, 50s, 60s that were being diagnosed would not be diagnosed today, that we would call it something different if we would even call it mental illness at all. Yeah. I mean, he, and he explored it a little bit with the one brother who starts out as, you know, the diagnosis is schizophrenia and then it's schizoaffective mm-hmm. and then ends up being bipolar. Mm-hmm. Although, I mean, he doesn't offer us any clues as to what's different because the only thing he describes is kind of a chronic psychotic state. Um, I guess we're led right. to believe that he must have fit the criteria, but I guess we don't have to question to that detail. But, but you know, there's an example where, I mean, he was critical of the fact that the diagnosis changed and how that changed yes. his treatment. But 
I don't know. He, he didn't turn that criticism again to anybody else to, to try to put it in context, mm-hmm. I guess. And, and I can accept that I'm, maybe I'm not the target audience, but I still think that he really could have <laughs> used a consultant or something. I mean, he talked to so many psychiatrists and researchers. I mean, did he ask anybody to read the book or, I mean, you would think that he would, but then there's, I mean, there's all these little why errors. Didn't, why didn't he call you? Um, you know, maybe he did. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was just some bait in case you wanted to bite. No, I, no, no pressure. I'll, no, I, it really, mm-hmm. yeah. If it asked me to read it, I would have. That's not what he yeah. wanted. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyone out there, you need a psychiatric consultant. You need someone to I'll read your uh, manuscript. verify your portrayal. Yeah. Absolutely. For a fee, of course. I mean, yeah. Unless it's really good. Unless... Yeah. Uh, Right. Unless Oprah thanks me for reading it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to I want to shift over to some other problems in the narrative. Great. And so this is a big uh-huh. category that I I've identified. I don't know if it's accurate, but mm-hmm. I think that he needs a villain in his book because every good story and or in not a good story like this one um when there's no stakes, mm-hmm. you need a villain to try to manufacture it. And so I think he's struggling with that. And so I want to talk about the mom. I, she's the most compelling person. I mean, I think that's why mm-hmm. anybody would even read this book is just, <laughs> just to read about the mother. So one of the daughters basically says that the whole story is trying to resolve whether her mom is a villain or a hero. And I would say the mm-hmm. author gives a lot more time on the villain side of things. Um, you know, so he talks about the schizophrenic mother as this relic of the mm-hmm. nature argument in the origin of mental illness. In other words, that mothers cause mental illness. Mothers cause schizophrenia specifically and, and maybe a lot of other mental illnesses too. And so, you know, we, we take from that, well, uh, that's not right. Bad mothers. Yeah. Can we be clear? Bad Yeah. Mothers. I mean, we. All right. he's clear that we're not supposed to think that. And then he goes on to give mm-hmm. the story of a schizophrenogenic mother. I mean, he doesn't, was, <laughs> and so I, I so I'm, I'm going to read some of the characteristics that he uses um, from the from the psychiatrist of that era. You know, cold, perfectionistic, mm-hmm. over controlling, restrictive, anxious, and prim, proper, but totally lacking in genuine affection. And then the criticism he levels against the mother, she's overly controlling, she's demanding, she invalidates the kid's feelings, she's aloof, she's pretentious. I mean, and then he he gives her story these gothic proportions. And you start wondering again back to the narrator, or you know, is is our view of her filtered through her children, or maybe more accurately, her children's therapists? You know, is they're trying to make sense of their mother? Fair. I mean, on the good side, she's a survivor, according to one of the daughters. Um, she clearly sure. is an advocate for her kids getting care. I don't know if you remember that story. She flies to New Jersey and gets these nutritional supplements that are supposed to you know, oh, yes. help everybody. Yes. And then the one mm-hmm. refrain the author keeps using is that she keeps the family together. And that's, you know, that's why they could even be studied is because of the, her steadfastness. I could make a real good argument that keeping that family together was not always helpful. I mean, and and did she keep them together? She sent one kid to live with another family that she didn't know well. Oh yeah, and another went to boarding school, right? And then I mean, the, those boys were going to the state hospital all the time. Um, her her origin story has a lot to do with her striving and dreaming to be part of some wealthy, fancy, aristocratic family. And, you know, I think that, again, at least part of the narrative is that she couldn't tolerate or didn't want to have kids like this, but that, that she, she's doing some of this, but also some of it to save her. And the most chilling gothic line of the whole thing is at the end where he quotes this old woman as saying, I don't, I was such a good mother. I don't know how things went wrong. I baked a pie every day, <laughs> which makes her seem comically monstrous. <laughs> right. Which I think is unfair. I, I mean, I realize he wanted some, you know, Hitchcockian line mm-hmm. or something. I mean, to leave her so detached right. from the reality or that she had not, she had not come to terms with things. Um, 
Yes, mm-hmm. I, I knew. I know that one stood out for people that I talked to. <laughs> um, yes, but I, I will say, yes. I, I will say in her defense, um, in in that same interview, or at least in that part of her life, or you know, over the series of interviews with the mm-hmm. author, she talks about the shame. She even, you know, she says how traumatic it was to feel so much blame from people. Um, it, I mean, it doesn't That's help fair. that she was in denial. I mean, they make a big deal about her denial. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I don't know. I, I think that's the moment that we can have some empathy for when she says that, how could I ask for help when everybody would blame me? I mean, maybe she deserves right. a little bit of blame for what happened to somebody. You know, that there's there again, there's the tension. <laughs> I think she could have broken up the violence. I think she didn't you know, have to bring that priest into their lives. I think. Yeah. Did anybody not see that coming? Other things. Did anybody not see that coming right? when, when they talk about, did he have like, was it pinball machines or some game? Like he had sort of big game thing in his basement. You're like, <laughs> Oh no, it's like such a cliche. Of I course. mean, that's actually the only connection that I'm not going to call into dispute or like a stereotype that I am going to say is not unfair, you know, fine. <laughs> Yeah. Exposing your kids to that priest was a bad idea. Everything else was, you know, maybe a difficult decision based on many things. But yeah, that had red flags all over it. But she liked him, right? I mean, I think they were they were uh, intellectuals together or something. Well, and her husband, I mean, it, it seems that she felt pretty neglected by him. I mean, she talks about six affairs well, sure. that he had. So here's somebody actually giving her attention, having no idea that she's ju- he's just uniting with her so that he can then prey on her children. I mean, 10 boys in one house, it's a gold mine. <laughs> I can see where she would be lulled into it. I mean, I, you know, I, I get it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the sh- shame is, is, I think, the thing that really... That's what I get from her origin story is it's the origin of shame. Mm-hmm. Her mom has the short-lived marriage to her biological father, who then she never has any contact with. And then her stepfather right. sexually abuses her. Um, and then we're told that she has fear of abandonment, which I don't know if she does or not. It clearly, the daughters talk about their own uh, problems with abandonment. And I don't know how much is projected onto the mom, but they even try to use that as mm-hmm. an excuse or, or an explanation for why she had so many kids. So here's a, here's a right. quote from that. For a woman who so often felt abandoned, here was a way to create all the company she would ever need. I thought that's a little bit of a stretch, but okay, I'll, I'll go along with it. I will tell you though, I used to hear theories like that floated by older, like much the oldest male attendings we used to have. I'm not sure necessarily where that came from or if it's totally fair. I'm not saying it's normal, right? But they were they're they were Catholic. Big families are very common in Catholics, especially back in the day. I mean, there could be lots of reasons to have that many kids and I'm not you know, saying that it's always normal or never pathological or from psychological reason. But I don't know. How much access did she have from birth control? How much, like, what was what was even happening then? It wasn't there something dramatic where, um, like, her doctor basically was like, you you really should not keep having children at your age or this, yes. is, this is a health risk and there's some defiance around mm-hmm. that. Well, there's some other speculation, too, that the author gives us. So it was a, a status symbol as quote, being Mm. known as a mother who could easily accomplish such a thing. And then that having babies was a way of, quote, running away from the past and trying to build something ideal. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. I mean. I just want to know. I mean, it's speculative. And I just, again, I would like to just know who's speculating here. It's based on what? It's fine. I just don't like this narrator telling me all this about this woman's inner life without. I'm fine with a daughter Mm -hmm. coming up with the story. I just, I don't know. Maybe sure. I'm being too picky about this. I don't know. Well, I, I think I think it wasn't fair, but maybe you would be more okay with it not being fair if, if he wasn't so hypocritical about it, right? If he says, okay, you know, in the course of this story, we will dispel the myth of the schizophrenogenic mother, and yet here's the worst, most self-centered, <laughs> uncaring mother that you could ever read about. Right. Like her trauma didn't cause the schizophrenia, but it probably caused a lot of other problems for these children. I mean, the, 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 her, her Correct, um, neglect right? or her, yeah, her way of parenting traumatized these people. 
Her way, her way of parenting. I mean, I was reading some like online reader reviews and there were several headlines of people's reviews that are like worst parents ever in all caps. Like that's what people took away. Not infrequently, it seems like that was the thing that that really stood out to a number of people. So I, I wanted to put a finer point too on this, um, at least how she's portrayed, you know, that she she mm-hmm. always wants things to appear perfect. She puts on airs all the time. I mean, she tells these mm-hmm. almost folklore tales of her her family of origin. There's this line too right. I thought was interesting, a conspicuous reader of very thick books. I mean, I thought that really summed right. it up. Like that <laughs> Like she's just showing off. She's showing off. What is right? this lady? Right? She right. should be barefoot and pregnant, and yet she's reading literature in Colorado And Springs. listening to opera and, yeah. Right. And, and, and the falconry, right? Oh. Which is like this blend of, of aristocracy and sadism. <laughs> he gives this really indulgent description of the falconry and how it involves sewing the bird's eyes shut. <laughs> That is supposed to mean something. And again, I don't know what besides just that this is one evil lady. (laughs) Well, then, and then the author creates this parallel that both the mom and the dad just, just wish that the children could be like the Falcons, you know, that, um, right. Here, here's a quotation around this. So, uh, Mimi also applied this persistent, (laughs) unyielding approach at home where sometimes there were more allowances made for the birds than for the children. <laughs> and then um, one other one. <laughs> this is what I mean. It's so dramatic. Yeah, it's so great. Right. If it wasn't about real people's alleged real lives. Yeah. She was a, if she was a fictitious character, I mean, even then you'd be like, it's a painting with a broad brush here. Like you should probably be a little more nuanced. Sure. But, uh, here's another one. Uh, mm-hmm. They had tried to install procedures and retu- routines to train their children. The children aren't falcons. I mean... <laughs> I no, they are not right. You can't just sew their eyes shut to teach them obedience, <laughs> right? The, you have to be a little, a little more, a little more subtle. Somebody would call the authorities on you. Talk about judgment. People will really judge you if you sew your kid's eyes shut. What is he even saying? <laughs> Uh, well, so okay, so the daughters are conflicted. Mm, are you? Are, were, did you come yeah. away conflicted about her? I mean, she's tragic. That she's definitely tragic, but we're not sure how much empathy we're supposed to have for her. You know, uh, she sacrifices for everyone, but she never got the life that she wanted or deserved. Right? I mean, she's she's. Right. Uh, I mean, she's straight out of a Tennessee Williams play. And I think that's it. like, was I conflicted? No, because I decided that she was a fictional character. <laughs> Yeah, it, or or she's the character that an adult child has tried to f- understand. You know, these are the highlights. This is the narrative that I, I have sure. so I can try to make some sense of her. And that's okay. I have no problem with that. The other thing too, and again, I think this is reflects the source material, is that the dad gets to just be an idealized figure. You idealize that guy? Oh, no, I don't. But clearly the author does. Or clearly whoever is providing okay. the information. He's larger than he life. Terrible. Well, okay. But the kids, yeah. the kids think that he's something they can never, they can never aspire to. They'll always disappoint him. Um, one mm-hmm. of the daughters finally at the end realizes that it's more complicated and she's struggling with how much blame should she place on his shoulders. But ultimately that's not resolved. Um, nor I mean right. probably can't be, but no, I, I thought through the narrative, like he's not really present, o- other than the fact that he's to be loved by all, including his wife, no matter what he does or doesn't do. Um, mm-hmm. And then he has a stroke, and he's just kind of out of the picture. He, he's just another dependent for the mom to try to take care of, right? And I guess yeah, maybe he just benefited from low domestic expectations of men at that time, right? But he never he also was never as big as he wanted to be or you know, thought that he deserved in his mm-hmm. career. Right? Yeah, he was always a contender. Yeah. Right. Right, but he never won. Mhm. Truly. Not not in the way that he thought he deserved, for sure. And he was shady. And, and it didn't, it didn't seem like the author was really condemning that either. Right. Of all the no, ways it was he very wanted to much condemn the mother, over. I, he did not, he did not offer an opinion on that, which, um, I think would be easy to overlook. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, you know, 
the author chose to spend all this time on the failings of the mom. And we're, we don't, there's not much exploration on the Flandering husband. Yeah, he was not subjected to either as much scrutiny or as much judgment as his wife. And maybe just the unfairness of that made me like him even less. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to talk about some other, again, we're, we're looking for villains, or at least the author is. And I think in general, he messes with timelines a bit. I, I don't think he does anything incorrect in terms of the, the history of psychiatry or the history of you know schizophrenia research. I just don't like the way he sure. overlays the family's history. I, I think he it, it, it's really hard to keep up with the dates. And I almost, I don't know that that's an accident because it, it challenges the narrative. If you realize, oh, we're, wait, we're in the late seventies and he's still talking about dilemmas from the fifties or something like that. Right. That, that was just right. another irritant mm-hmm. that I had. Again, it was all in the service of a compelling narrative, right? That, 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 that was the most important part to him. Yeah. And, and the same thing with medications. Um, so on one hand, he tells us mm-hmm. that they make people worse. Um, and not just mm-hmm. that they're toxic and it's hard, they're hard to tolerate. I mean, those are absolutely fair. But they actually, have bad side effects. Yeah. yeah. But no, it worsens a person's condition. But then he says, um, these drugs change the lives of thousands of people, helping them create space between themselves and their delusions. And then we right. shift back to the fact that the drugs are, quote, warehousing people's souls and that medication shouldn't be the, quote, substitute for a doctor's care. And then just a few pages later, you know, quote, these drugs were so stable and so effective at soothing psychotic episodes. And I don't think it's one or the other, but I almost think that he constantly is in this black or white idea. Right. The other thing right. too is, you know, they, they, they bemoan the system, understandably. Mm-hmm. I mean, the system is broken. Sure. Many of these patients are right. not cared for. Um, but he acts as though we don't know how to do it better. And the reality is, oh, we know how we have some really great studies, but nobody will pay for that kind of care. Um, I mean, I see all of these wraparound service studies and they're fantastic. They keep people out of the hospital. They keep them on lower dose of medications as a result. There's case management. There's, there's tremendous amount of support from Mm -hmm. community and that's great. So, I mean, he criticizes the, he criticizes the outcome and the lives of these people and, and chalks mm-hmm. that up to psychiatry and the system. But right. he doesn't actually say, well, what is it about the system that fails them? It's money. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That's a very good point. Um, I think we've touched on, so, so we, we could walk away from the story understanding that the origin of schizophrenia is complex and that environment mm-hmm is a factor, but not the factor. But I think there's this part of the nurture question that we've been, we've been hinting at um, about what might result from this kind of traumatic experience. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the kids had, uh, I mean, he even mentions how Peter would have been called somebody with oppositional defiant disorder. You know, many Mm -hmm. of the kids had conduct disorder. There's the antisocial personality traits we talked about, even in the affected kids or, or who would, go on to, you know, be more obviously affected. Um, right. There's even one of the grandsons, you know, that ends up at that therapeutic boarding right. school for two years at $8,300 a month. And, you know, the, the story that we're, as we're given is that this is anxiety projected on him by his mom because he had smoked some weed and hung out with some skaters. <laughs> it's those, not funny. It's tragic. It but is. like, what? Yeah. Well, should we, should we go through some of the brothers or should we, um, maybe not all of them, but there's two that I think might bear some more discussion. I would at least like for people to be more, I don't know, just more reflective. Yeah, go for it, Dave. Okay. Yeah, bring it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, I want to start with maybe the easier of the two that I think we should, that we need more information about, I, in my mind, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the fourth child, Brian. Mm -hmm. So... There's accusation that he sexually molested his sisters. Um, Mm -hmm. He's the one who we're told that he does a lot of LSD in high school. He drops out of college. He ends up in California in the band. Um, There's Mm -hmm. a quotation here that no Galvin brother dropped more acid than Brian. And then in 1973, (laughs) he murdered his, I think, girlfriend or fiance and then then completed suicide with a gun. He had bought the gun the day before. So they were, they were saying, you know, there's some premeditation to that. Mm -hmm. 
And then we're told the mom finally reveals that at one time in the past, he was prescribed Novane, which is an antipsychotic drug. And so then, Mm -hmm. and then that's the end of the story. Oh, he had schizophrenia too. And it's like, well, but the brother right after him. Lots of people were and are prescribed antipsychotics for a variety of reasons, but continue. Well, especially somebody like him who, you know, dropped acid all the time, got in trouble and was felt to be part of the counterculture that needed to be restricted. His his own mm-hmm. brother, the very next brother, Michael, right. that was his story. He ended up in a psychiatric unit a couple of times. He was prescribed an antipsychotic. But we walk away from him saying, oh, that was not an accurate diagnosis. It may have been drug related, but but clearly that wasn't enough information. And now we have his life as it has panned out that he does mm-hmm. not have a psychotic illness. But again, Brian, we don't we don't get to go back and revisit like, well, yeah, one time prescription I don't know. Should he be in the six? I don't know. I, I just <laughs> not, five, not not based enough. on Four? well, right? He should not be included based on the information information they've given. Maybe there's information that well, I'm of course there's lots of information that's not included in the book. I don't know if it would have supported a diagnosis or not. Yeah, we don't know. I, I think a more thorough discussion would have been in order. I, I think the same discussion that the author has around Michael and the counterculture, we sure. could have at least talked about it with Brian. You know, that there are other explanations that just, I mean, it's its actually like just a couple of sentences. Oh, Mimi said he was on Navain. Right. Well, right. hell, he's got schizophrenia too. And I guess maybe the part I don't like about that is then, it's like the assumption is he must have been he must have had schizophrenia because right. he did this horrific thing. And again, I, it's that's just a, there's a part of that that I, I find distasteful. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, so the second brother, Jim, is more complicated, um, at least in the way he's medically treated towards the end of his life. But in his early development, what we're told is that, well, we're given evidence that he has a severe mm-hmm. alcohol use mm-hmm. problem, works as a bartender. There is a quote that he's drinking too much all the time. He has explosive violence. At age 16, he threatened his mother with a pot. Um, He gets married, has multiple affairs. Um, He is the perpetrator of severe spousal abuse, physical and emotional. So he sexually abused two of his sisters. A brother um, later said that, so again, there's at least an allegation. We're not really clear. Um, We do know that he ends up on psychiatric medications but it wasn't until he assaulted his own son before his right. wife finally left him. And then, and then he, let's see, he slashes uh, his sister's tires. There's a note at one point, we're almost two thirds of the way into the story, that his paranoia and delusions never went away. But there's no, there's no, de- there's never detail about right. what his psychosis must mean. And, you know, honestly, people with antisocial personality disorder may have paranoia sure. and certainly grandiosity. He ends up dying from heart failure. So this is a quote, heart failure related to his use of neuroleptic drugs, which they somehow end up calling that neuroleptic malignant yeah. syndrome. But anyway, I guess my point is, I don't know if he was, if he had schizophrenia. I know that he was treated with antipsychotic drugs, but I also know that they may have been treating somebody with severe right. sociopathy. All of the story we're given is a story of somebody with severe sociopathy. <laughs> and the management of explosive violence sometimes sometimes includes Correct. antipsychotic drugs. Well, and that do you feel like that take where they say, you know, and then he died because of these medications he was given is again some confusing victimization. I'm not saying that he couldn't also be a victim. He was definitely a perpetrator. I don't know. It's like and then is he supposed to be let off? Is he off the hook for all of this violence that he perpetrated if it's a result of this schizophrenia? I don't, I don't. That was the mom's argument for sure. Yeah, right. right. I yes, mean, I think so. But is that, is the author backing that up? I mean, wh- who's there to question that? And I guess saying that then he died from these horrible meds he was forced to take, um, which I don't know if the, if these medications also maybe helped him stop assaulting other people. I mean, I'm not the one to say if that's worth it or not, but it's not, he's not just a a perfect victim of the illness and the medications that I don't know, you know, who's, who is alleging what. And so if we, if the mom is a good guy, then I guess we can believe her. But then if she's 
the bad person in all this denial who's delusional, then why are we going to go with her retelling of what her son's illness was and the cause of his death? Not to mention as you, you stop short, but it's worth pointing out, doesn't like medically, in terms of medical accuracy, that all doesn't necessarily make sense either. Just the description of it. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't know what was wrong with this man. I mean, obviously. I don't either. No, and, no, no. Yeah, I, and, but I guess what I'm, know. I guess what I would ask then of a, of an author is that it is not cut and dry. So let's not pretend that it's cut and dry. Or at least, at least if you're going to only present this part of his behavior, don't make everyone then conclude, well, that's what people with schizophrenia do because that's not accurate. And I think that's what, I think that's what irritates yes. me. Yes. I mean, you're not coming off as salty as I thought you might for as irritating as you come of this. <laughs> I'm trying to rein it in. I know you are. You're being very eloquent. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we can stop here. I mean, what what's your takeaway? Like, what do you think? My takeaway, despite all of these criticisms, is that this book is still worth reading, as long as it is not to be taken as representative of the lives of people with schizophrenia. I think that it is a very compelling story that, again, you know, the narrative parts, the story of this family, whether it's a metaphor or even a caricature, I thought that it said a lot about maybe values, the values of our nation, me- mental illness, stigma, how we still view mothers. I mean, all of these conflicts that you and I are arguing about and that or, or discussing, arguing with the author about, I think that Mr. Kolker is making these things out to be black and white and definitive when they're not. I think if uh, take it as a you know, as a interesting piece of writing that brings up a lot of questions, I think, I think it's great. And again, not perfect, but, but great. And, and definitely a lot to think about. Again, I think people from all different backgrounds found it interesting for different reasons. Um, And, you know, as long as you're not a psychiatrist or like a neuroscience researcher, (laughs) you might, you know, find a lot in here that doesn't get under your skin as much as long as you're not taking it as some sort of like definitive text. And it, I mean, okay, I'll, 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 I will, I see that. I will also say though, you have to have a high tolerance for boredom in terms of the last third of the book. It's tedious. Oh yeah. Oh, it is. And I think I even, you got a lot more The reconciliation between the daughters is tedious. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is tedious. Okay. Without a payoff. Without a I payoff. think it'll leave you unsatisfied. But you know what you will be satisfied about is Mimi. I mean, it's sewing the eyelids shut on a hawk. That will be satisfying enough, I, I think it's a falcon, but, you know, point taken. It's, it, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> a bird of prey. A, a, a bird of prey. I mean, as we know, the details are fuzzy. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, we really want to hear from you. So please give us your feedback and send in your questions. You can email us a voice memo or a regular email at callthepsychiatrist at gmail.com. You can call and leave us a voicemail at 760-779-2477. That's 760-PSYCH77. And you can join our Facebook group uh, where you can post questions or we can interact. Uh, Please help us out by subscribing or following this podcast in whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Tell a friend about our show and leave us a rating and review so others can believe our show is worthwhile. All right. Thanks. Take care.